So uh, the next speaker we have is uh, the founding member of the Uber AI Labs. Now, he's, uh, he loves philosophy. He did his bachelor's in philosophy, master's in philosophy, and loved it so much he got his doctor's in philosophy, but this time in computer science. He's a professor in computer science at the University of Wyoming. And uh, you might have know, heard his name quite a lot, especially last October when you decided to beat humans in playing video games <laughs> and uh, got a score which is just not possible in usual times. So please welcome Jeff Kloon. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I am going to talk to you today about Go Explore, which is our new algorithm for hard exploration problems. So in reinforcement learning, a grand challenge is effective exploration. And that's particularly true in hard exploration problems. And there's two types of those. The first are sparse reward problems, in which you very infrequently are told what to do, and you still have to figure out what, uh, what to do and how to solve the problem. And the classic benchmark there is Montezuma's Revenge. In fact, this game has proven so hard that it's become almost a grand challenge in itself in AI research to try to do well on. Uh, the other type of problem are deceptive problems, where the reward function is actually lying to you. It's telling you the wrong thing to do vis-a-vis -vis getting the globally optimal policy. So for example, in this maze here, if you start here and your reward function is distance to the goal, the reward function is telling you to go north when the actual answer is to go east. And your job is to ignore the reward function. So a classic example there is pitfall, which is a particularly challenging problem because there are very few rewards that are very far between, but there are lots of ways to get small negative rewards by hitting enemies or hitting obstacles, et cetera. So almost all algorithms learn to do absolutely nothing, to just stand still because that's the way to not get all these negative rewards, which is obviously not the globally optimal strategy. So on traditional reinforcement learning algorithms get a score of 0 to about 2,500 on Montezuma's Revenge and a score of 0 or negative on Pitfall. Even planning algorithms such as Monte Carlo Tree Search that have access to the underlying game emulator still get a score of 0 on these games. So the typical strategy to solve these hard exploration problems is to use intrinsic motivation algorithms, which effectively reward agents for getting to new states or lowering their uncertainty. And there's been numerous attempts, including by myself, to try to use these intrinsic motivation algorithms on these games. But if you look at the performance, particularly on Montezuma's Revenge and Pitfall, you see that they help a little bit. Uh, they get scores roughly about three to 4,000 when they're done right. And recently, there was one or two papers that got scores roughly about 11,000 and it in one run solved level one of the game. So these intrinsic motivation algorithms help, but why don't they help more? Why aren't they solving the game? We hypothesize that there's one type of thing that they don't do. An, intri oops, sorry. An intrinsic motivation algorithm in this situation might say, I'm going to take the green door and, my and explore the entire green wing of the house, for example. But when it's done exploring that entire space, what it doesn't do is say, I should go back to that room where there were two doors I didn't take, because that was a promising exploration stepping stone from which I should further explore. They don't do that. So we call this problem detachment. And here's a little cartoon of how it works. Imagine that you're an agent and you start in the middle of one of these two, ma these two mazes here. By chance, you may go and explore the west maze, shown here in purple. And also by chance, you may flip and start exploring the east maze, where you also find lots of intrinsic motivation. But then what happens? Afterwards, this is there's no intrinsic motivation over here, and you're randomly flailing around in white, not touching any green. So now you have no signal for how to further explore the problem. So we say that this algorithm has detached from this promising frontier. It's forgotten that this was an interesting space from which it could explore. So uh, the proposal that we have is to explicitly remember promising stepping stones and where promising locations are in the space such that we can go back to them and explore from them. And we'll show you how to do that. Another problem plaguing these intrinsic motivation algorithms is called derailment, or we call it derailment. And it's the idea shown in this example. Imagine if you had an agent that could get all the way to here, which is extremely imp uh, impressive. 
Sorry, this is skipping ahead. Imagine if you had an agent that could get all the way to here. What most RL algorithms would do is say, oh, that was a promising new spot. I should, go, I should do that again. So they'll take the policy or the agent that could get here, and they'll run it again. But they want it to do something slightly different because it fell off here. And so they'll randomly perturb the policy, either with parameter space noise or action space noise. But this, if you think about it, is going to derail the agent from ever even getting back here. Most random perturbations to this policy will cause the agent to fall off the wall. And that problem is, gets worse the longer, more complex, and more precise the sequence of actions that's required to get to that extremely challenging place. So what you want to do is get back to this thing first, then explore from it. And that's one of the insights behind Go Explore. Now, you might counter, well, if you do that, if you get back to here first with no exploration, no stochastic perturbations, and then explore from here, you will hurt the robustness and the reliability of this policy. And I agree. However, remember, we're still exploring. We don't know if the reward is up here or over here or over here. So our philosophy is, let's first try to solve the problem, figure out exactly what it is to do. That's stage one. Stage two is then to pay some extra costs to robustify only the policy that we know leads to high reward. So we're only going to pay that cost at the end once we know how to solve this problem. So Go Explore, therefore, I don't know if you saw that, but it divides this problem into two phases. Phase one, first solve the problem, and phase two, robustify. So here's how phase one looks. We're going to initialize the algorithm by just starting in the starting location and taking a couple random actions. And if we get to any interesting new states, which you can barely see here, we'll add them to an archive. Then we'll run the following steps on loop. We pick one of the interesting states that we visited, say this one. We will first go back to it without adding any exploration whatsoever. And then we will explore from it. And if we discover new states, we will add those to our archive. And then we'll rinse and repeat. One important caveat is that if we get back to a cell we've already visited before, but in a better way, which is like a shorter trajectory or a higher performing trajectory, we'll store that as the path that gets us to that cell. So we'll swap in the better solution. So this avoids detachment because it explicitly remembers the promising stepping stones that we visited, so we can always go back to them and explore from them. So if you contrast intrinsic motivation and go explore, I think about intrinsic motivation as like a narrow flashlight beam that it looks in one part of the house and then moves to another part of the house and then moves to the other part of the house, always kind of moving through the house in a, with narrow focus. Go explore, in contrast, is like turning the lights on in the living room and then the lights on in the neighboring rooms and then, the, then the, those neighboring rooms and then the neighboring rooms of those rooms until the entire house is fully illuminated and you expand your sphere of knowledge. So we can't run this algorithm in the original high dimensional space because it's, uh, there's too many states. So we conflate cells into, uh, we conflate states into cells. And that means that interestingly different states, such as these ones here, have to map to uh, the same cell. And if a cell, a state is interestingly different, then it maps to a different cell, like over here and we'll run our algorithm in cells instead of states. So our first attempt to um, create this kind of downsampled, conflated state representation, we wanted to have something that had no game-specific domain knowledge. So we literally just downsample the image, which is really dumb, but it's very fast, and it's very general. And we found that it works quite well. So we're also, when we choose which cells to go back to from within the archive, we prefer cells that are productive, meaning they've recently led to new states, or newer, meaning that they haven't been tried that many times. To actually return to a cell, we're going to try to do it as easily as possible. So if the environment allows us to be deterministic and resettable, which all simulators allow you to do, then we're just going to reset the state from the last time we visited this cell. However, if the environment requires you to be stochastic throughout, then you could use a goal condition policy such as a UFA to go back to the particular states that you know how to visit. Now, we, since we're using the resettable version, what we end up with is actually, for each cell, an open loop sequence of instructions that gets us from the same starting location back to that cell. And I just want to point out that there's no neural network at all in phase one, which is kind of interesting. Once we get back to a cell using that, by replaying that sequence or resetting the state, then we're just going to take 100 random actions from that cell. Again, no neural network involved. 
So phase one of this algorithm actually solves level one of Montezuma's Revenge 65% of the time, which is a, a substantial increase over the state of the art. But it's still just this open loop deterministic sequence of actions. So now we'll go to phase two, where we want to robustify and get a reliable policy that from any situation can imitate this behavior. And so we're going to do that by, by training a neural net via imitation learning, which we just heard a little bit about. So any imitation learning algorithm should work here. Uh, and we know that they can solve Montezuma's Revenge and pitfall if we give them a human demonstration. But now we have an automatic algorithmic way to generate these demonstrations. So we can do that quickly, cheaply, and provide as many of these demonstrations as the algorithm can consume. So we use the imitation learning algorithm uh, from Salomons and Chen, which we call the backwards algorithm. And the way that it basically works is it starts at the end of a sequence of a demonstration. It backs up just a little bit and runs normal RL to recover the original score known to be possible from this location. And once that's reliable, then it backs up a little bit farther and runs RL again to recover the original score, and so on and so on, until you can trace out and mimic a long, complicated trajectory. So after we've robustified a neural net that can now deal with stochasticity in the form of sticky actions, random nuance, et cetera, we can now achieve three times the previous state of the art with GoExplore with an algorithm that still does not have any domain knowledge, which is quite impressive. Now, when we published these results, it created quite a healthy debate in the Twitter sphere and on Reddit uh, and in the community about when should we require stochasticity during training. Uh, in other words, did we cheat in terms of producing these results? And the question is, should you re require stochasticity at test time only, like we do in this work, or should you also have to deal with stochasticity during training time? That led us to realize that we actually have two different kinds of problems that RL researchers and industrial practitioners are interested in solving. The first class, which I argue is the larger class, is when we only care about the final solution. We want a reliable solution, and we don't really care how we got it. So for example, in robotics, if you want an algorithm that can put out forest fires or find survivors, you don't really care how you got that particular solution. You're just happy that you have it. And the same is true for creating characters in simulated games or in video games or uh, controlling business processes, et cetera, et cetera. For all of these situations, we think deterministic training is fair game because if it helps us solve previously unsolvable challenges and we want those solutions, then we're happy. There is, however, a second class of problems in which, oh, sorry, I want to mention one more thing. For the foreseeable future, most RL algorithms anyway will have to use a simulator. And because the RL algorithms are sample inefficient and because they can take unsafe actions, we don't run them on the real world. And that means, in my opinion, that we might as well take full advantage of the fact that we're using these simulators to help us solve these problems. There is a second class of problems, and those are problems where you have to confront stochasticity during training from the start. And that is if you know you're going to have to learn in the real world, such as in robotics, uh, or if you are, want to understand biological learning. So our proposal is that for each of these benchmarks, we should have two versions of them. One that allows stochasticity during training, and, uh, and or, what, sorry, one that allows stochasticity during testing only, and one that requires stochasticity during training and testing. So to be clear, all of our scores and claims are about the first kind. Um, we have not yet tried Go Explore it with stochastic training, although we are optimistic that it'll work quite well uh, with goal condition policies because it still takes advantage of the insights of Go Explore. So, in my opinion, ideal algorithms should be able to harness domain knowledge if you give it to them and it's easy to provide, although they shouldn't require domain knowledge. So Go Explore, as I already said, works without domain knowledge, but we can also inject domain knowledge to make it work better. And that's in the cell representation. So we can just consider cells to be different if they have, say, different combinations of things we know to matter, like XY location and room number. I want to point out that we still extract this information from pixels, and this is just for phase one. The final neural network still plays the game directly from pixels. You can see here that adding domain knowledge, which is orange, dramatically improves performance over blue. It solves all nine levels of Montezuma's revenge on average, which is the first time in history that's been true by a computer algorithm. And it does so in half the time. 
And if you then robustify the networks, it solves the first three levels of Montezumas, which are the only real unique levels in the game. Levels three, three plus are all slightly different. And our networks, because they're neural networks and they can generalize, actually generalize to those new levels. And we end up, on average, scoring a ridiculous 660,000 points on this game, on average, and solving 49 levels of the game. And if you let this thing, if the best policy just run, we actually recently got a record in our own lab of 18 million on Montezuma's Revenge, solving over 1,100 levels, which is ridiculous. This beats the human world's record by an order of magnitude, and thus achieves even the strictest definition of superhuman performance. Um, it even beats previous work that gave algorithms the solution in the form of a human demonstration, which you can see here in red. And that's because we can generate more and better demos to feed our imitation learning algorithms. So here you can see the agent uh, solving uh, level one of the game, uh, going through the early levels. If you're like me, I've been staring at the first, say, six rooms of this game for way too long. So it's really fun to just sit back and not only watch an RL agent solve the game, but absolutely crush it. So here you can see it's finally getting to state-of-the-art performance and scores that were never seen before, level two, then level three. The score eventually rolls the score counter not once to get to a million, but 18 times in the case of our max agent, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not an expensive algorithm. It only takes about a day on modest hardware. On Pitfall, where no prior algorithm had scored greater than zero, our algorithm without domain knowledge gets to 22 different rooms, which is actually impressive and we think is state of the art, but it doesn't get any positive reward. But with domain knowledge, which you can see here in orange, it gets to every room in the game and gets a score of 70,000 in phase one. And after phase two, when we have a reliable, robust neural network, it can get a score of 20,000 points on average and a max score of 64,000. And that's with sticky actions and random no ops. So both of these numbers substantially advance the state of the art. And here you can see the agent jumping on crocodiles. It's learned skills like uh, swinging on ropes over lakes, jumping obstacles, enemies, going down underground, over fire, etc. In fact, these skills are generalizable. So in one case, our robust neural network actually got a score three times higher than the demonstration it was training to imitate because it learned these generic skills and applied them uh, later on in the game. Some future directions, there are more in the paper. The first thing I want to point out is that almost every piece in this machinery is quite simple and stupid. And that shows you that the real heavy lift here is the decomposition, the overall strategy that you're seeing. But that said, you could swap in a more intelligent piece for each one of these modules and make it work even better. So some directions that we're particularly excited are, are swapping in uh, learned intelligent exploration instead of random exploration. So when it learns to explore in one part of the world by, say, learning to walk or climb a fence or jump over an enemy, it can use that to explore in other parts of the game as well and reuse that skill. We're also interested in learned representations instead of random or engineered representations. There's many ways to do that. And we're interested in demonstrating that this can work even when you have to deal with stochastic training, as I already mentioned, by goal condition policies. Um, we're also particularly interested in one application area because we think it's really going to help, and that's in robotics. So you can imagine many robotics tasks are very hard exploration problems. If you just tell your robot to go find survivors, for example. But here is a pipeline where you could solve the problem in a deterministic simulator, then robustify in a stochastic simulator, then use any of these techniques or others to transfer to reality, and then you could optionally continue to train in the real world. There are some similarities to previous algorithms. There are lots more in the papers. I want to mention just a few. The first is that the key insight, is, which is to remember stepping stones and return to them, that actually comes from the quality diversity family of algorithms, which I helped co-invent with Jean-Baptiste Moret and Joe Lehman and Ken Stanley. In fact, this algorithm is an enhanced version of the Map Elites algorithm. And that same algorithm was behind our paper, which was on the cover of Nature for Robotics, which showed that you can get a robot to recover from damage, say, if this is its damage behavior to actually recover a really nice behavior like this behavior in literally 28 seconds in terms of wall clock time. So this produced state-of-the-art damage recovery in robots, and I highly recommend checking out this family of algorithms. 
Um, it's also somewhat similar to graph search algorithms, like breadth-first search, for example. Uh, but there are big differences. One is we had to add a robustification phase to handle noise. And such algorithms are intractable in high-dimensional spaces. So we actually think that a really promising, fascinating research direction is porting the central, awesome principles of these great classic graph search algorithms to high-dimensional uh, spaces, which involves its own host of challenges, which are listed here. It's also a little bit similar to MCTS, except MCTS does not try to actually visit all states in the search space. It doesn't do conflation, and it also hist uh, empirically just hasn't performed very well. So to conclude, we think that Go Explorer is an extremely promising new algorithm for hard exploration domains. Uh, it opens many exciting new research directions. I've already mentioned some ways that you could enhance Go Explore, which we think is exciting. But what we're really interested in is seeing Go Explore hybridized into other algorithms within the RL community, machine learning community, and by industrial practitioners. So the key principles could be woven into whatever you're working on. For, and those principles are to remember good exploration stepping stones, to first return to them, and then explore from them, and finally to first solve the problem before then robustifying it. So we're really excited to see what people in this room and in the community more broadly might do with these principles in their own application areas and algorithms. And with that, I'd say thank you to my collaborators and to you for listening. <laughs>